Is it snowing? René Descartes and knowledge of the physical world. Welcome to this explainer about the theory of knowledge of René Descartes. Descartes has written about many different topics, but they are, are intertwined. So there are many different uh, texts that are about his argument that it is at least in principle possible to have knowledge of the physical world for instance that it's snowing in amsterdam he lived in amsterdam for quite some years um, and basically what he is doing he is arguing against the skeptic that is the philosopher that says that knowledge is not possible Prior to Descartes, there was a philosopher called Michel de Montaigne, and he can be classified as a skeptic. Skeptics argue that we cannot have knowledge. So consider you are walking through a forest and you look at one of the trees. So you have to believe that there is a tree in front of you. Now, how do you know this? Well, you could argue that you see the tree so that your visual your sensory experience provides you with a justification that your belief is actual knowledge you know that there's a tree in front of you because you see it so that's an argument you could put on a scale so you have the belief there's a tree in front of me you have an argument in favor of that belief that it's actual knowledge however you could put a counter argument on the other scale of the balance and then you could argue for instance that you are hallucinating uh, the tree or you're dreaming about the tree and there is no actual tree so now you have an argument against your belief that there is a tree in front of you which one is it do you now know that there is a tree in front of you or do you know that there is no tree in front of you and you're merely dreaming about that tree you don't know so Michel de Montaigne argues the scale is in balance and that goes for every belief you have you could always have an, an argument in favor for the belief and an argument against the belief so you'll end up with the claim I know nothing and even that went too far for Montaigne because if you say I know nothing then it's implied that you know that you do not know anything so he claimed or he, he didn't make a claim at all he says what do I know he asked a question and a question is not true or false you're not making a knowledge claim when you ask a question but Descartes the question what do I know was a starting point he wanted to have knowledge he wanted to know which of his beliefs were not merely opinions things he things to be true but are actually true so if you are looking for truth then at least once in your life he argues you must try to doubt everything as far that that is possible so he hopes that by using the method of the skeptic the method of doubt he hopes to find something which he cannot doubt so something he actually knows now he looks out of the window and sees that it's snowing. Can he doubt that? And he says, well, reason now leads me to think that I should hold back my assent from opinions which are not completely certain. So if you can doubt something which is not completely certain, I do not assent to it. That means I don't say, yes, it's true. Uh, also he doesn't immediately claim that it is actually false he doesn't say well I see it's snowing I can doubt it's snowing and therefore it's not snowing but he says well let's let's consider uh, let's assume that they are false let's consider beliefs that I'm not certain about as false so if I can doubt something it might not be false but let's for the moment 
classify them as false. Descartes regards knowledge as a building. So what he wants to have is a foundation that is firm. That is, he needs to be sure about the foundation of his building of knowledge. If not, if the foundation of a building are undermined, then obviously the entire building collapses. Now, he has this idea from mathematics. You have axioms. So those are claims, uh, statements that you cannot doubt from the rest from that the rest of mathematics follow so he wants to basically break down his set of beliefs the building of which he used to believe that it was knowledge but now he thinks well maybe i can doubt many of those beliefs or maybe all of those beliefs let's see what happens if i doubt all my beliefs maybe i find a foundation that I cannot doubt. And then he needs a different method, we'll get back to that in a moment, to build his new building that is actually a building of actual knowledge. Okay, Descartes is starting to damn all his beliefs. And of course he cannot doubt them one by one, that would take too much time. So he goes about it in a systematic way and he says anything or anyone that has ever deceived me intentionally or unintentionally I cannot trust as a source of knowledge. So he trusts nothing and no one. And then he starts by thinking okay which groups of beliefs can I dismiss as being knowledge that is which groups of beliefs can I classify as doubtful and therefore not as knowledge? Maybe they turn out later to be knowledge, but for the moment we just assume that they are false. And he thinks back to his time he was getting his education at the Jesuits of uh, La Flèche, one of the most famous schools in Europe, and he thought, well, if there are wise teachers, they will be here. Um, so uh, they taught him a lot. And they taught him about, for instance, Aristotle. Those Jesuits were Aristotelians. And they, well, basically said that Aristotle was by and large right in almost everything. And then Descartes says, well, as soon as I finished my studies, and he could become a teacher himself, for instance. He found himself beset by so many doubts and errors that he came to think that he hadn't gained anything from his attempts to learn something, except that he learned he was quite ignorant. He didn't know anything at all. And one of the things he figured out was that Aristotle was wrong, in some cases at least. But his teachers thought, to put it, black and white that aristotle was always right so his teachers weren't lying to him but they also didn't tell him the truth so how could he trust his teachers to be a source of knowledge he can't he can doubt anything and everyone anything they said every teacher that ever taught him something they cannot be trusted as a source of knowledge so everything he has learned from his teachers goes out of the window it's doubtful and therefore not knowledge and we goes and think well what about the things i perceive with my senses so for instance he was living in amsterdam he looks at a tower in the distance in the distance the, the tower seems to be well it is round and then later when he walks through Amsterdam and he actually is at the tower looks at the tower and it's not round but square so his eyes have deceived him at least in one of these uh, occasions on one of these occasions and this also goes for very small things your senses might deceive you so your senses cannot be trusted so they're also not a source of knowledge because you can doubt that your senses inform you 
about the world in a proper way. Now, you could argue, well, that goes for very small things and very tall things in the distance or things in the distance. But for example, that I'm sitting here by the fire, wearing a winter coat and holding a piece of paper. That has to be true. I cannot doubt that, right? But he says, yes, I can doubt that as well. Because I might be dreaming. He then writes, I see plainly that there are never any sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. How do you know that you're not sleeping? The court ar argues, answers, I don't know. I might be sleeping. So everything my senses tell me, even about being by the fire and reading or something like that, is doubtful and therefore it's not knowledge. Okay, but if I am dreaming, then I'm sitting by the fire, then there is still a fire somewhere. Fires do exist. Also, uh, mathematical truths are still true, whether I'm dreaming or not. And 2 plus 3 seems to be a very easy problem, right? So that equals 5. And then Descartes says, well, I have been wrong about mathematical problems, complex mathematical problems, before. I thought I'd found the answer, and now later it turned out that it was false. The problem was even more complex than I thought. And then he asked himself the question, may I not go wrong every time I add two and three, or count the size of a square, which obviously they are four. Um, and maybe I am wrong there. Maybe these mathematical problems seem to be easy, but actually are not easy. There might not even be a world. Well, why would he think that? Why would he think that 2 plus 3 does not equal 5 or might not equal 5? He says, suppose that there is no good God. Descartes was a Catholic. He did believe in a good God. But now he says, suppose, just for a thought experiment, there is no good God. But an almighty and evil, a malicious demon. But this demon has used all his power to deceive me, to make me think that Amsterdam exists, that I have a body, that two plus two equals four, uh, stuff like that. Basically, he makes me believe anything that I think is true, but actually all these things are false, even the fact that I have a body or that even that bodies exist. There might not be a physical world. And mathematical truths are also doubtful because I think 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true. That the problem, what is 2 plus 2, that that's easy, but it might be a very difficult problem. Why do I think that it's an easy problem? Because the evil demon makes me believe that. He is all-powerful, right? So he can make me believe that something that is complex is, is simple and something that's simple is complex. So I'm never sure what to believe. I can doubt even mathematical truths. Now we're still thinking about what we know, or Descartes is thinking about what he knows, and he still has no positive answer. It seems that the method of radical doubt, the method of his opponent, the method of the skeptic, indeed tears down his building of beliefs and he seems to be ending up with nothing. So the skeptic seems to be right. So he writes, I shall think that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, sounds and all external things are merely the delusions of dreams which he, the evil demon, has devised to ensnare my judgment. I shall consider myself as not having hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses, 
but as falsely believing that I have all these things. So he doesn't say, I know I don't have all these things, but he says, since I can doubt them, since I can doubt that these beliefs are actually true, I, for the moment, consider them false. They are not knowledge. So what, then, is the conclusion after this introduction of the evil demon? The court now seems to have to agree with the skeptic, because he says, what remains to be true? Perhaps just one fact that nothing is certain. That's just one step away from asking the question, what do I know? Because you don't want to claim that nothing is certain, because then you're certain that nothing is certain. Someone then you would say, what do I know? But that is not the end point for Descartes, but the starting point. But now he uses the method of radical doubt. He asks this question, what do I know? He doubts every form of belief he has and concludes, well, maybe indeed nothing is certain. That's quite disappointing. Is there really nothing that Descartes cannot doubt and therefore can know? Well, he says the evil demon might be quite powerful, might be all powerful, but even he cannot deceive me in thinking that I am, that I exist, because if I think that I might not exist, so if I doubt my existence, then I have this thought, I think, and because I think, I have to exist, because well, who else would do the thinking then? It's me who's being deceived by the demon. So he says, and let him deceive me as much as he can, he will never bring it about that I am nothing. So as long as I think that I am something. And this takes us to one of the most famous slogans, conclusions of Western philosophy, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So he concludes this in uh, different ways, uh, or he formulates it in different ways in different uh, books. But this is what he says. I think I am. That has to be true every time this is conceived in my mind. So every time I'm thinking that, that has to be true. I cannot doubt my own existence. And then he says, I am certain that I am a thinking thing. Okay, but... If I am sure that I'm a thinking thing, doesn't that imply that I now know what is required for a belief to not merely be a belief, an opinion, but to be actual knowledge, that I am certain of it, because now I am certain that I exist. So doesn't this lead me to a method I can use not to doubt my former beliefs, but to establish that new beliefs are not just beliefs, but actual knowledge. And he says, well, I have this clear and distinct perception that I exist. Doesn't that amount to a new method? Let's pause for a moment. Let's forget for a moment the argument that Descartes is developing to show that indeed, in the end, he can have knowledge about uh, the fact that it's snowing. Let's take a look at some of the concepts he now uses, thought and a clear and distinct perception, because that's what we need. By the term thought, I understand everything which we are aware of as happening within us insofar as we have awareness of it. Hence, thinking is to be identified not merely with understanding, willing and imagining, but also with sensory awareness. So these days we would call that mental states, mental events, consciousness, uh, things like that. So it's much broader than what we these days call 
a thought. So that is important to see that if you have pain, that also falls under the category thought. Okay, so it's basically anything of which you are aware of, which you are conscious. So that's one concept we need to be clear about, so that we are not thinking that thought merely is uh, a representation we have in language about the world or something like that. It's much broader than that in Cartesian philosophy. When is a perception clear? So a perception is something you, you perceive with your mind. So he's talking about that, that, right? So not an observation with your senses, but a perception, an observation, uh, something that which you are aware of with your mind. I call a perception clear when it is present and accessible to the attentive mind. Just as we say that we see something clearly when it's present to the eye's gaze and stimulate it with a sufficient degree of strength and accessibility. An example would be pain. That would be, if you are in pain, that would be a clear perception. And why is a perception distinct? Descartes writes, I call a perception distinct if, as well as being clear, it is so sharply separated from all other perceptions that it contains within itself only what is clear. So basically, it's not confused with anything else. There's no confusion. So 2 plus 2 equals 4. That is a clear and distinct perception. Okay, not at this moment in the text, but we, we stepped basically away from the argument and just elaborate a little bit on what he means by thought and a clear and distinct perception. So you could have a clear perception, that of pain. It's very clear to the attentive mind when you are in pain. But is it also distinct? Well, it isn't, because usually you will think, my pain is in my foot because, well, you, you stepped onto a nail or something like that. And Descartes would argue the pain actually is in your mind. So then you're confused. It's not distinct. But it is clear. A mathematical concept or claim like 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's clear and distinct because there is no confusion with anything else. Let's return to Descartes' argument. He has so far doubted everything, but he cannot doubt his own existence. He says, I think, therefore I am, has to be true each time I think that. Why? How do I know this? Because I perceive this clearly and distinctly with my mind. So now we can conclude the following. So now I seem to be able to lay it down as a general rule that whatever I perceive very clearly and distinctly is true. And this gives him a method to find new beliefs that are actual knowledge. But he does have a problem. And the problem is that he has used the evil demon that is all powerful and is able to deceive Descartes in thinking that there is a physical world, that there are other human beings, that there is a city like Amsterdam, that two and two equals four. Those beliefs are all classified as doubtful and therefore not as knowledge. So what he basically needs to do now, because he came up with the evil demon, is, well, he has to get rid of the evil demon and basically replace it with the good demon, or at least that's his strategy. He, and he says, I must examine whether there is a God. And if there is a God, whether this God is a deceiver, because if you have a God that is a deceiver, basically you have the evil demon. So he needs to show that God exists and that God is good. And if he can do that, then he might take it from there and argue that he can have knowledge about the physical world and about the fact that it's snowing and things like that. Okay, how does he do that? Obviously, he is going to use the method of the clear and distinct perception. He says... I am Descartes, I am a thinking thing, there might not be a physical world, I do not know that 2 and 2 equals 4, and stuff like that. So what he needs to do is to show that God exists and that God is good and that God then could be 
the thing that warrants that uh, other beliefs can also be classified as knowledge. Now, he says, in myself, in my mind, I find this idea of God, of a supreme, perfect being. And then he says, well, that idea of a perfect being has as its nature that it exists, because that is part of <laughs> being perfect. So it's more, basically, it's more perfect to exist than not to exist. And this goes down to a very old argument. So this is not, certainly not something Descartes came up with. But he says, this means that God has to exist. Thumbs up, God exists. So step one, check. God exists, now we need to show that God is good. So this resembles an old argument. It's an argument made by Anselm of Canterbury. Uh, it's very very briefly uh, the first premise of the argument is God is that which nothing uh, greater that is more perf perfect can be thought so it's an idea right you, you think of something and God is that thing uh, uh, that is uh, the most perfect thing premise two is existence is greater more perfect than non-existence hence God exists. So this is a very brief argument that Descartes basically uh, adapts and uses. It's called the ontological argument, the ontological proof for the existence of God. Okay, so Descartes uses this to show that God indeed exists. Now he needs to show that God is not only existing, but also good, that he cannot be a deceiver. And then he says, well, basically he gives the same argument. It's clear and distinct to me that in deceiving is imperfection. Uh, since God is perfect, he cannot be a deceiver because that would mean that he would be imperfect. So two thumbs up. God exists and God is good. And that's what he needed. So basically I, we don't need to go into detail of the arguments and whether they are convincing. I hope you, you see that in breaking down his building of former beliefs, he used the evil demon to even doubt that two and two equals four, and to even doubt that there is a physical world. But once he has done that, he really needs to get rid of the evil demon, because if he doesn't get rid of the evil demon, he will not know anything else than the fact that he exists. He can only know, can have knowledge about the fact that he exists, and that's it. Because, and, and he exists as a mind, because he might not even have a body. Two and two might not equal four. There are no other people. Amsterdam does not exist. He never knows anything else. Amsterdam might exist, but he doesn't know. So, and he wants knowledge. Okay, so basically what he needs to do is to replace the evil demon with the good demon, and now he's done that. We're almost there. The Kurt now says, I doubt everything of my former beliefs. I break down my building of alleged knowledge, basically a building of opinions. He can doubt everything, even that there is a physical world. He can doubt that 2 and 2 equals 4, but he cannot doubt that he himself has to exist because if he doubt he exists well he thinks he does not exist and therefore he exists you need to exist to have a thought like that he sees this clearly and distinctly he perceives this clearly and distinctly with his mind and then he says that is my method of gaining knowledge what does he then say okay i perceive in myself the concept of god God is perfect. Basically, he says, existing is part then of God's nature. Basically, to exist is more perfect than not to exist. And the same with being good. Being good is more perfect than not being good. That is, in deceiving, there is imperfection. God is perfect, so he will not deceive me. And now, he says, I am inclined, that is my nature, to think of the ideas I have of the physical world 
that they actually come from the physical world, from the corporeal things in, in the world. Um, and if God uh, would allow anything else than the physical objects in the world to be the causes of my ideas, my knowledge or my beliefs about those worlds, then he would be a deceiver. So he says, I do not see how God could be understood to be anything but a deceiver if the ideas were transmitted from a source other than corporeal things. It follows that corporeal things exist, so physical things exist. The world exists. Amsterdam exists. And that means that if he's walking through Amsterdam and he sees that it's snowing, he can say, I know that it's snowing. And then he can ask himself questions. How come that snowflakes are always flat? And how come that they are all different? And how come that they all have six sides? Those were actual questions that Cart asked. And therefore, you need to be convinced that it's possible to have knowledge about the physical world. And basically, what we've seen now is how Descartes argued that, at least in principle, it is possible to gain knowledge about the physical world because the physical world does exist. That's it. I hope this was useful. Stay safe.